So let's talk about what everyone isn't talking about. Hashtag fees must fall. One person was killed on Wednesday after police fired rubber bullets to disperse a group of protesters at the Witt University in Johannesburg. The protesters have vowed to continue protesting against the financial exclusion of students. The university says it has owed 1 billion rand in outstanding fees accumulated over the past seven years. The students are demanding that those who owe the university up to 150,000 rands in fees still be allowed to register for the next academic year. According to the student's representative, about 80,000 students are still not registered because of the financial exclusion problem. It has gotten to the point where a black body has had to die for governments and institutions to take students seriously and to recognize the inequalities that exist that ensure that poverty, inequality, unskilled labor, and every other thing that has been the legacy of apartheid is sustained for generations to come over and over again. That's the conversation we're going to have today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure that you press the subscribe icon down below so you can get notified every single time we upload a new video. But don't end it there. Become a Candid Conversations patron and subscribe to our website so you can get notified every single time we upload new blogs. And really stay tuned for all the content we have up there. Now that that's out of the way, we're going to get straight into today's video. So Fees Must Fall has been something that has been ongoing. It obviously started back in 2015, 2016. Obviously, it was mixed in with the hashtag Roads Must Fall movement. And it was just a statement by young people to say we are tired of the symbols of colonization. And those symbols of colonization are in statues. They are in institutionalized racism. They are in exorbitant fees in higher education institutions that majority of this population cannot afford and so we as students are making a statement to say we want this country to reform so that the inclusion that modern day governments have been talking about is actually executed and we don't have students who still have historical debts or who are sitting at home are getting an education and other factors that have ensured that the status quo from apartheid is being maintained up until today. Talk about fees must fall. I think it's something that is a symptom of the broader problems that we have in our country. Because if we think about it, the student activists who go out and protest every day about fees and student debts and decolonized education were once children that had to pass through the systems in our country of getting a basic education. Some were privileged enough to go to a you know previously white school who still went to schools that literally still resemble these schools that were built under the Bantu Education Act. And so I can only imagine how when you get to an age where you're 21 or 20 or 22 and you're in a tertiary institution and you find yourself being excluded for financial reasons, the thing that will drive you to go out and protest will be a built up resentment and anger and really fatigue um, from a system that has not served the needs of the black community um, post apartheid. So when you look at Fees Must Fall, I always say, think of it as a symptom of a broader system that has been designed. It goes from basic education to a lack of job opportunities to institutionalized racism in, in big corporates and in the corporate sector and private sector all the way to the different dynamics that exist between black and white people, the different stereotypes that exist, that you find yourself as a black person going into a white space, having to break down. Um, it's in all those things where constantly every day you're faced with a plethora of factors that are difficult. Do we complain? Not really, because I think if you want to be successful, you have to be able to deal with life's challenges. But I do think it beckons us to ask if our country is a place where a black person can self-actualize at the same rate that a white person can to really break down um, why the inequality in, exists in our country and how we can change it. When I started to really look at the cold hard facts and compare the quintessential black child to other races that were previously advantaged 
by apartheid. And stark differences exist beyond one's willingness to work hard to achieve success. I live this through traveling to work every day. I live in a very white community. I live in Hillcrest on the west side of Durban and it's a very affluent area. It's where old money lies. So the big bosses, the shareholders of the biggest corporations that are JSE listed live in this community and so the amount of wealth locked up in homes in Hillcrest is vast. But the sad part is that it was obviously built um, as an area that was for white people and around Hillcrest exists previously um, black communities known as homelands. And those communities are Molweni, Kwangulosi, Kwandengezi, Embo and other nearby communities that exist where cheap labor used to come into Hillcrest to come, you know, work um, in homes as domestic workers. And now it's changed obviously, but majority of domestic workers in this community still come from those previously known homelands. And even though malls have been built, such as Watercrest Mall in, in, in Hillcrest, a lot of the you know unskilled labor comes from black people who live in those areas that were previously um, disadvantaged and so majority of the cashiers and tellers and cleaners and, and, and everyone who does low paying jobs comes from those areas because till this day job opportunities have not been created in homelands and so when I realized that this inequality is not caused by one's willingness or lack of, of willingness to work hard to achieve a better life. It's not caused by just that. It's evident that these young people that have to come from Kwandenges and Embo to work as cashiers to be able to build up enough funds to go to university who are the children of parents who are affected by Bantu education and the injustices of the past. Until today, nothing has been done to correct that. And so we'll still have young people who maybe have to work for 10 years before they can even get a degree or get a, a proper qualification that is recognized by the formal economy in our country. And so if one looks past the why don't you work hard for your success mantra and look at the evidence, empirical foundation of the causes of poverty in our country is really evident that we have not done enough to address the inequalities that exist within you know townships and rural areas and areas that were really neglected and that were called for you know separate development by the apartheid government so i think it's incredibly disappointing on the part of our present day government that nothing much has been done to create opportunities in homelands for people to not need to have to travel you know 10 or 15 kilometers to go to work every day just like how it was in apartheid and so these are the very same students who come from these communities that end up going to institutions like WITS and UCT wanting to get included wanting an opportunity to better their lives and their families lives and when those opportunities are constantly closed off and when people are excluded and when people owe a hundred thousand rand in student debts let alone being from a family where the income is less than two thousand rand per month it causes frustration and it just asserts that we live in a society with a government and you know public and private sector constituencies that it just shows a commitment to the perpetuation of poverty of black young people for years and years and years to come and so it's made me ask the question of you know if south africa is a country where one can fully self-actualize where one can actually reach the top level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and i think if we are still fighting for a basic education that's proper if people are still fighting for water and electricity and food and job security it's highly unlikely that you'll find the next mark zuckerberg in a township where you still have to fight for your life every single day and it's those opportunities that are ignored when economic policies and social policies are made the very fact that councillors um, and, and, and mayors and people who are supposed to be in charge of development in the public sector are selected not you know through qualification but just through cadre deployments must be one way that sustains weak economic policy that fails to touch the lives of the very least South African and that's why you know, when I think about BEE and affirmative action, those policies are great. I think it's relevant in a country like South Africa. 
but the notion of having white capital trickle down into black communities not emancipate black people um, economically is something that I think is very, very far-fetched. Corporates have found very smart ways of being able to increase their PE score without really having any organic transformation in their organizations, either through forming other companies that aren't really in the business of the main company, but are there to just increase PE points, or form other organizations that can be manipulated in such a way where one can increase their PE score. And so even from that point of view, there isn't really a willingness to want to create an integrated South Africa where our economy looks like the majority of this country. So we need to revisit BEE and affirmative action and see if there isn't another way to ensure that we still have the inclusion of black people. But that cannot be done if education if education is not made accessible for young people in this country. Otherwise, we will still have, you know, young black people working as cashiers and tellers for big corporates like Spa or ShopRite or Pick and Pay. And at the end of the day, all those dividends from those companies go to old money. They go to the founders of those companies who happen to benefit from apartheid. If we want to achieve organic growth in this country, government needs to sit down and when forming economic policy, the question has to be, how will this policy touch the poorest of the poor. Maybe how this economic policy will trickle down to at least the middle class and not ever get to the poor majority in this country. Because I think there's a misconception that majority of black communities in this country are middle class, but that's not the truth. People are living on low income ranges. And so every economic policy that is formed needs to be interrogated and scrutinized and cross-examined and asked, how will this touch the least of the least in this country? How will this economic policy give the child of a domestic worker the opportunity to go to VITS or to go to UCT? Currently, all the economic policies we have don't give the opportunity to a young person whose parent is a domestic worker or a gardener the opportunity to go to these institutions. And so when we look at the Fees Must Fall movement, we need to think of how it's such a nuanced conversation and movement. It trickles into how as you grow up as a young person in this country, you're going to face a lot of situations where you recognize that I may not be catered for here because of my skin color or my history. And yes, that should never limit you in your be limited by your skin color. But the reality exists. The reality of the fact that our parents are not from old money. Our parents really are first generation professionals who have made enough to survive, but to build wealth and to thrive in South Africa, that's something that is long far gone. And the continuation of not funding education for young people in middle class families and poor families is going to ensure that we have the Fees Must Fall protests every single year, year in, year out. Secondly, I remember watching um, the news a lot in the past two weeks and Blade Zamanda is obviously giving commentary on the recent administrative errors that have been occurring in NASFIS. And when he spoke about UNISA and how UNISA wasn't supposed to accept as many applications for the 2021 academic year, my blood literally boiled. I was frustrated at the fact that already getting into institutions like WITS and UCT and Stellenbosch is such a hard endeavor for any young black person because the fees there are higher than the income our parents even earn at some point. And, and, and secondly, even getting there um, physically is hard because when you get to Johannesburg or Cape Town, you need to look for accommodation and we're exposed to so many different risks in that process. So an institution like UNISA has been pivotal to ensure that we get more graduates getting into the workplace and getting opportunities. I personally believe that a lifelong learner, whether you have a degree or not, but in this country, the way things are formed, a degree sometimes is a good cushion that you need to have to survive economic times and to get the basic job to supply for your basic needs. Face the reality of how things are formed. Getting a formal education is a stepping stone into levels of wealth and emancipation. Blades Amanda said that UNISA shouldn't have accepted as many applications as it did. My first question was, why hasn't the 
capacity of UNISA being expanded to accommodate more young people who want to study because your government has made sure that formal education is a requirement for most industries and to get into the formal economy so how could you tell UNISA not to accept as many applications because you know when you're doing that you're just ensuring that more young people are staying at home the questions to ask ourselves it's the question of why hasn't education been free it's the question of why haven't new universities been built and not technicons on colleges learning academies and centers that are at the same capacity at wits or even go above and beyond what wits and uct and all these other institutions that were previously for white people being created in modern day south africa to accommodate a growing population i mean we're at 60 million people in south africa we cannot still have the top three universities being the ones that people want to go to knowing that they won't be able to accommodate everyone so building new institutions needs to be an imperative priority in the list of priorities that our government has and then thirdly, why haven't we expanded the capacity of current learning institutions to take in more young people? Because the answer cannot simply be don't accept applications. Because if the answer is don't accept applications, that is you saying yes to more young people being uneducated. That is you saying yes to more young people working at spa and checkers and all these other multinational corporations as cashiers, no paying jobs, which would guarantee sustained and generational poverty in this country. That is a black government saying yes to more black poverty. And in my terms, I think that is completely, completely unacceptable if we want to live in a country that is a hospitable climate for every single young person. The Fees Must Fall movement is not going to go away. This is actually just, it's starting. I think COVID-19 made it worse because it exacerbated the inequalities that exist in our country. But going forward, if reforms are not made in our economy, in our political space and our economic space to accommodate every single young person who wants to get an education in this country, this country will face many issues. Government may think that by not funding students, they are somehow rescuing our economy. First world economies are built on skilled labor. They are built on high labor productivity and high, and high labor productivity is built on continuous education of every single person in that country. I often look at how Singapore is a country that is marvelous in the way in which it built its economy. It doesn't have many natural resources, but it invested in human capital and that human capital has been the reason why they've been one of the top performing economies of our time. And we as the African continent have so many young people. Our continent has the largest population of young people, including South Africa. If you had to look at the demographics of many places in this country, the median age is around 22, 23, 24. It's obviously only in the affluent areas where the median age is around 40 to 50, and that's old white money. But the truth is, if we want to invest in our country, we need to invest in our labor. For our labor to be productive, that labor needs to be skilled through getting an education. And in as much as lifelong learning is great, I think to face the reality of how our country functions, it's very hard to step into a white corporation as a young black person without a degree to say, hey, I'm ready to be your new options markets manager. They'll show you the door. It's the way it is. Um, we unfortunately haven't reached the stage where you can be anything and do anything you want to do. You can, but you'll face a lot of resistance and it's going to be a hard road. But in an age where the concern for many people is putting food on the table today, access to an education today is something that needs to be prioritized. Fees must fall in movement. And anyone who tells me that we cannot fund education and that people must just accept the fact that they need to sit at home and not do anything and accept their fate and not in life, that person is condoning black poverty and that person is not, is not for the mandate of developing an inclusive South Africa where our economy looks like the people that make up the actual country. I think it's sad that it took the death of a black man, Mtogo in Dumba for our country to actually take and prioritizing decolonized education seriously. It should have never been the case. The day the VIT SRC raised the concern of the 8,000 students that were excluded from the academic year, that should have been the day where our government said, the bug stops here. Let us ensure that these children are educated. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Time was left to pass. 
And all of that time was just filled with being ignored and being ignored. And Fierce Must Fall is just one representation of it. Black people have been ignored by a black government for many, many years. We've been ignored in service delivery. We've been ignored in failing to create jobs that pay people enough. We've been ignored in building proper infrastructure. We've been ignored every single time, every single time a politician chose to be corrupt. It's being ignored. And so I think the buck stops here. And if we truly want to see any economic development in our country that includes black people, many reforms have to be made and the first reform has to be investing in human capital let me know what you think the fierce plus four movement has been a big conversation in south africa i'd like to know what your thoughts are how you've been interpreting the situation how you think we should fund tertiary education and whether i've got it all wrong let's start the conversation and i'd love to hear your thoughts but from my side thank you so much for watching this video i cannot wait to see you again on the next video stay blessed stay well stay safe and see you next time <laughs> Is it